right, that should should be enough time to penalise people who are on time. Um, fantastic. All right. Thank you, everyone, for popping in. Looks like there's a couple more people jo joining in now. So um, this will be all recorded for everyone. everyone has to pop out early um, or wants to share with some of their team. We'll record it for the attendees and the registrants, and we'll send it out. Um, but, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. I'm Alex from Fly Freely. So if this is your first time jumping into one of our webinars, uh, we're doing a bit of a series with industry experts um, talking about, I guess, their journey with drones, both personally and professionally through um, their companies. Um, we help a lot of um, uh, organizations manage and build their drone programs. And I think by far the, number, the one is the biggest feedback you get is how can we be more helpful and peer to which people say, you know, we just want to hear what others are doing uh, in this space. We want to hear what people like us, what they've done, what they've learned, what they, what they recommend us do and don't do. Um, so this is all part of it. So very, very, very lucky. This is our last uh, webinar for the year. So 2023. Um, and yeah, very lucky to have uh, Nick Hart here from from SAPN. So um, uh, in Adelaide, there's been some storms recently, and, and un unfortunately, and, and he's been quite busy. So we're very, very thankful to have him on the show, and uh, yeah, share a bit about his journey so far. So uh, Nick, if I got you there, I might um, jump straight into it. That's good. Uh, jump through. Awesome, mate. Thanks again. And uh, maybe maybe kick things off. Yeah, maybe tell a little bit about yourself, mate, your career and, and what sort of led you here today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, thanks, Alex. And thanks for um, inviting me on. Always happy to talk about drones uh, with uh, people that are interested. Um, yeah, my career, I started my life as an electrician uh, in category one, uh, sorry, tier one type construction. Um, ended up sort of looking after some medium and high voltage work on um, private heavy industry, oil and gas, uh, resource sector, um, and ended up jumping to the other side of the meter into the utility space with SA Power Networks about five years ago. Um, so uh, my my journey with drones is relatively uh, new, um, not from the traditional sort of remote control space, which a lot of people are, but um, more so uh, saw a need within uh, my role and within the industry and saw um, the capability of uh, what drones um, could potentially do. And uh, yeah, for about the last three years, I've been um, pretty uh, eager and engaged with getting them into the business and, and utilizing them for, um, for the benefits they have. Awesome, mate. Eh? Awesome. And uh, might jump straight across. Good. Oops. Uh, key way into the first question. So yeah, for, for SAPN, uh, and you've been involved in a bunch of different areas and yourself as a um, uh, asset assessment manager. Um, can we give a bit of a background to, I guess, the SAPN journey into drones? Uh, sort of where, where did it start and probably why did it start and what sort of led you to this point today? Yeah, so uh, really good question. And I've got to give a lot of um, uh, acknowledgement for March and Ball, who is our chief pilot for both um, SA Power Networks and um, Enervan. Um, we uh, he he uh, is chief pilot across the two Reox and keeps him extremely busy. But uh, he's uh, the person within um, our organisation that really brought drones to life um, in the early days. Uh, he had a, a really keen interest in drones um, and remote control aircraft uh, personally, um, and was someone who saw some opportunities. So um, off his own back. Uh, brought the capability into the organization um, in, you know, well, I'd say his baby steps. Uh, we bought some um, relatively uh, capable for the time um, airframes uh, and mm. started doing some data capture. And, and it sort of uh, grew from there. Um, you know, we're probably talking six, seven years ago when I'd say the industry was maybe not in its infancy, but certainly uh, far less progressed than it is today. Um, and so he was instrumental with with really standing up the business case and getting the business on board um, in the early days to to get um, SAP and behind using drones uh, for some of our work and some of our data collection. So, um, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, my role title is Asset Assessment Manager. And so the most of my work is in... Um, providing the organization with sort of actionable insight into the power line uh, network that um, I oversee. So uh, if I get the stats right off the top of my head, we've got about 78,000 linear spans of um, power line 
uh, that covers about 178,000 square kilometres of the state. Uh, we are one of the biggest utilities in uh, the country in terms of uh, geographical uh, sparseness. Um, and that brings with it some massive challenges for us to be able to make sure that that uh, network of power lines is safe and reliable, um, both safe to the public, but also um, safe from doing things like starting bushfires, which is really my major um, concern in my day-to-day -day role. So mm -hmm. um, when I joined SAP and um, I'd seen where we'd got to with drones, I saw uh, a huge opportunity for data capture um, that would support me in doing my job um, better and, and um, supporting uh, the organization more widely and maintaining that safety and reliability. So uh, at the time, I think we had maybe half a dozen drones, max, uh, may have been mm. less. Um, and yeah, since then, like I said, about three years ago, uh, we've grown to 55 airframes now, I think, um, 50 pilots, um, and yeah, quite a spectrum of, of use cases. Awesome, mate. And and that first couple of stages there, the the half dozen um, pilots and, and airframes. What was the you said sort of collecting data? Was that sort of just photogrammetry? Was that sort of lidar scans, or what would that sort of look like? Uh, just photography initially. Um, we yep. were doing so real time assessment using um, our skilled power line workers. Uh, so they mm -hmm. were using it to gain that alternative perspective, um, and they also used it uh, on uh, the transmission network. Uh, in South Australia, which isn't under South Australian Power Networks. But, um, yeah, uh, they had a need to inspect their um, transmission network in their bushfire risk areas, and uh, they quickly rolled out um, a capability to support uh, Electronet and, um, yeah, managed to inspect a lot of their power line using drones only, um, mm -hmm. but in real time. So the data collection was exception reporting only um, mm -hmm. when they found a defect on the network. Uh, but being able to get that alternate perspective on something like um, what we call a lattice tower, which is one of those big transmission towers, uh, getting that perspective from a drone rather than a helicopter was really, really important for that. And um, it really, mm -hmm. it, it put the capability um, into our executives' uh, sort of minds and those of mm -hmm. Electronet, um, I don't think they'd mind me saying, um, mm -hmm. because the number of defects that they found from drones as opposed to a helicopter from the ground was um, significantly more. Mm -hmm. I'd imagine too the, the um, safety as well. I know there's obviously different use cases for different uh, pieces of equipment, but having the drone way closer and far cheaper and more more safe than a person sort of dangling out, um, I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. And that safety was pretty much the driving factor with that particular contract. And um, and yeah, it it taking people out of the sky is something that I'm pretty eager on doing as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I still run uh, I think well three to four helicopters a year. For about six months of the year, um, flying the mm. whole of our bushfire risk area. Um, mm. They fly very close to uh, what they call the dead man's curve, which is where their um, ground speed is too slow and their altitude is too low to be able to uh, conduct an auto rotation landing if they had a mechanical fault. Um, mm. So it is a really dangerous um, type of operation for helicopters to be doing what they do now. And uh, mm -hmm as I'm sure many people on the call um, would appreciate, there is a safer alternative um, and that is drones. Um, mm -hmm. And we can maybe talk about some of the barriers that come with that at the same time. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, a massive driving factor for us is um, that safety of, of our crews. Awesome. Awesome. I was going to say that's cool. For next question then. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess that's probably part of the thing today of um people at different varying levels we, we we sort of call it the five stages depending people are starting and experimenting versus sort of um integrating and, and standardizing um but i guess for other people in those areas and your experience and, and i think it's also pretty interesting too i know drones we love them we, we think it's great and i think it's a, a much better alternative but they also have their limitations and you know they have their tricky things to deal with so um i guess for someone in your position maybe even a couple of steps pr uh, prior to where you guys are at what would be sort of your advice to people getting started and sort of getting into this area? I'd, I think at a fairly early point in our sort of journey, uh, we hit that fork in the road uh, that, at least for a lot of our operations, um, was do we go um, with uh, licensing all of our pilots or do we go in uh, an excluded category uh, approach and... Mm. Um, go the far simpler route and far cheaper route, but forego some of that 
the requirements with um, with our pilots having repuls. Mm -hmm. um, we made a decision to pilot, uh, like, um, license all of our pilots, so all 50-odd are full uh, repul holders with quite a few of them um, carrying uh, sub-25 tickets and our chief pilot carrying uh, some type of accreditation. Uh, mm -hmm. as well as um, myself also having um, IREX. So um, my feeling um, and perhaps maybe not advice, but at least my my learning from that was that having a workforce of pilots that had a much deeper and broader appreciation of aviation risk, um, aviation standards, um, and having not come from aviation, which isn't necessarily unique, but I guess the drone industry has pilots that have come from many walks of life. A lot of them, um, particular in the more complex operations, are from aviation and kind of inherently understand aviation risk. Mm -hmm. But um, for me, having a workforce that is fully aware of the risks of putting a drone in the air anywhere mm -hmm. um, and the risk to other uh, aviation airspace users it is really, really important. And I think it's what has a significant factor into our track record, the number of flights and amount of hours that we've done um, mm. over the last couple of years as an organization uh, with no significant um, uh, incidents. And mm. I think human factors based uh, non-conformances that are you know, easily in the single digits, if not counted on one hand. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it was a, a more difficult path. It slowed us down. Um, and we acknowledged that and it was frustrating at times because we wanted to get these drones in the air, particularly the ones they were flying, mm. um, but we wanted to do it well. And so I think really if you haven't already and you are considering that sort of position or do we do we go and do the whole hog, and I know it costs money as well, mm. um, get, get people fully licensed with their REPL um, and their AROC, uh, mm. Yeah, I'd say give it some very good consideration because it will provide um, benefits in the long run. Mm, absolutely. And I think there was um, guys from Hobart Council last week or week before um, said a bit about that around getting them trained up because uh, as well as insurances, like, I mean, that shouldn't be the main driver, but it definitely makes insurances much easier to deal with and much more compliant. Um, and then, as you said, too, if, if they're trained across it and all of a sudden you need someone for a random, slightly complex uh, flight, they've got the capability and you don't have to wait or delay or outsource to someone else. Um, there was actually something interesting too. I know there seems to be a split for us is that we see um, what we call like part-time pilots and then like obviously the the people like March and, and who are highly versed and, and very strong in the aviation world. Um, of those, I guess, 55, if you don't mind me asking, is it, are they all fully dedicated pilots? Is that, that's, that's, that's their core role or do you have some that are, you know, maybe surveyors who five, 10% of the time they, they, they do flying? Yeah, we do have a, a broad spectrum there. Uh, I believe all of our pilots are, are power line workers, mm -hmm. um, first and foremost. Uh, the initial use case, and I'll split by, I guess, how we operate them. The initial use case is what we call our tool of trade drones. Um, they're the sort of sub seven kilo, uh, generally sub two kilo. Um, we'll say Mavics of the world. And, mm -hmm. and the reason we call them tool of trade is that we wanted to use them opportunistically. Um, mm -hmm. Where it made more sense to put a drone in the air than to either put a helicopter in the air or um, take a eight-ton truck out to a, a location to, let's say, scope a fault or um, better understand a project. So with those pilots, they're using it opportunistically rather than in a programmed way, and they're, they're not flying frequently. Mm. When they do fly, though, the, the low-frequency, high-value sort of um, paradigm is at play, and we're seeing... Um, instances where rather than potentially deploying a full line crew, three people in an eight ton truck to go for a long drive, to go and have a look at something that may or may not be a problem. Mm -hmm. We put one person in a light vehicle, um, either closer to the location and we deploy them. So we're talking mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of dollars in co uh, cost savings each time they do that, wow. but it is infrequent. Um, so, you know, we've got our safety management system that takes that into consideration and, um, the data logging capabilities and some of the automation that's been built around um, prompting our well call them part-time pilots mm. uh, to make sure that they are uh, still current and have their recency and all those sorts of things um, is really helpful with that. And uh, yeah, we do see um, see the guys keeping on top of their um, 
their license in that regard. At the other end of the spectrum, we've got um, our more specialist operations um, where we're talking sub-25 uh, airframes, and it might be LiDAR, might be, um, we've got a phase one IXM100 camera that we're using, uh, you know, might be thermals, night operations, sort of things that uh, don't fit within that excluded category by a long shot, um, and therefore require a lot more um, recency, a lot more hours under their belt, uh, better awareness, mm-hmm. um, you know, one use case where we're doing uh, night operations, doing thermography of power lines. You know, you're flying that drone in um, a, an environment where you can't necessarily see the power lines, um, you know, through the naked eye, uh, mm. but you are flying within a few meters of them. So um, having really skilled, really experienced pilots that are regularly flying um, is important in those sorts of uh, use cases. And so, yeah, we've got those pilots as well. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, having that availability too. Imagine the dispersed assets of if you rely on three people to to sort of do one job, you can sort of bottleneck it. So that's um yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Um awesome, mate. Michael Cross. Uh also love the orange drones. I think we've had a few comments back on that. So it's super cool. Um I was going to say for you, and you touched a few points then, you may have covered a lot of this just before, but in your role as the asset assessment manager, what's sort of been, um, has specifically improved your role? I guess use of drones, you were saying safety is pretty important, some cost savings, um, but I guess what was it looking like prior to um, or, or, or without drones? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll quickly touch on the the orange drones. Um, we... We were very conscious because we fly our drones in public realm. You know, we, we're a power line operator. The power lines are not on private property typically, mm-hmm. or they're over our easement that's within a private property. So um, both from a ground risk, we don't have direct control of that ground risk um, when considering the actual operation, but we also have to be very mindful of our customers and the community and making sure that we weren't going to be adding to it's died off a little bit uh, in recent years, but that demonizing of drones that was sort of happening Mm. circa three to five years ago where everyone was worried about them peeking over the back fence. Mm. So we made a conscious decision to make them yellow, to make them very conspicuous. Uh, Sorry, orange. You know, not just because it's our brand coloring, but the fact that if someone saw a bright orange drone um, flying nearby, they're not going to think that they're up to no good because who would make it so (laughs) conspicuous? And I think that's been a very uh, real and direct um, input into the fact that we've had almost zero uh, complaints from customers. You hear of some horror stories from around the country and around the world with people Mm. who don't like drones Mm. and uh, what they attempt to do. We've never had that issue. And uh, I think both with our information systems, what we're doing with advising customers of drones being in the area, but Mm. also having a bright orange has been really, really um, beneficial. It shows that it's not just someone having a play with a a Mavic drone from JB Mm -hmm. Hi-Fi, but it shows that we're doing something important with them. I was, I was going to say it's almost like a, what's that thing? If you're wearing a high-vis shirt, people let you in anywhere. So it's, a, <laughs> it's more something of a, like that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It makes and, you feel more uh, professional. So that's awesome. That's cool. When we're on the edge of visual line of sight, obviously yeah. always within line of sight per our um, instrument, um, you can actually see them a lot better in the sky. <laughs> 100%. I was going to say, particularly if those are uh, night flying or anything like that. I know there's lights on there as well, but I could imagine be so yeah. much more um, aware that this is a professional um, assessment. Exactly, exactly. Um, more directly to your question, I guess, you know, drones to me are a bit of a mechanism to a, a larger objective. You know, like for me, um, my role and, and how it's improved um, my function within SA Power Networks is, you know, I, I'm about data collection. Um, mm. You know, I need to know something about the asset that is hundreds of kilometres away from um, decision makers. And the best thing I can do is to get the highest quality, most up-to-date uh, information to those people's hands so that they can make decisions while being very remote from um, all those inputs. So a mm-hmm. bit more of a nerdy um, sort of data management uh, aspect to mm-hmm. my um, broader function. And that's that's where um, I guess give some context as to why I was interested in drones. So mm-hmm. um sort of our narrative around uh, why drones internally has been sort of more data, uh, sorry, better data more frequently for a lower uh, unit cost. So um, if I have to deploy a a, a helicopter, um, you know, we're talking about a a Bell Jet Ranger 206 or something of that ilk, fairly uh, impressive and expensive uh, aircraft um, Mm -hmm. with a pilot, uh, with a passenger navigator, 
costs stack up, um, as you could probably imagine, and um, you know it does get very expensive. So, mm. being able to deploy a drone to achieve similar um, has been, you know, a chalk and cheese. Mm. What a mm. helicopter can do, though, um, is can fly a hell of a lot further than we can fly with a drone presently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the the limitations of visual line of sight for me have been a source of much frustration for a, a good long while now. Mm -hmm. um, and while I appreciate the reasons why they're there, uh, it's really hampering our ability to leverage the full capability mm -hmm. of a remotely piloted airframe um, with a high quality payload on board. Mm -hmm. um, so we're still having to rely on a crewed aircraft uh, putting people in that dangerous airspace um, and the environmental factors associated with it. We're burning through a lot of fuel to be flying like we do, mm. um, low and slow. Uh, and customers don't like us flying uh, helicopters at 10 to 20 metres above the power line. So we're talking barely 100 feet off the ground. Um, yeah, with a, a Bell 206, um, you know, uh, causing all sorts of uh, issues for um, our our regional customers, uh, mm -hmm. in particular, you know where we might have um, skittish animals and the like. So, you know, there, there's a bunch of reasons why drones have been good for me. It's that customer engagement. You know, we're not annoying them with a, a big um, helicopter, and mm. they're far less distracting as well. Um, you know, we've had uh, reports of when we've flown a line adjacent a highway and. Obviously, people aren't going to be paying a lot of attention on driving at 110k an hour when there's this bloody great helicopter flying um, barely overhead uh, mm -hmm. next to them. So, you know, from that customer impact, it's a lot better. From that environmental impact, it's a lot better. For the work mm -hmm. crews, not having to deploy people is a lot better. Um, however, I will say it's not quite where it needs to be because mm -hmm. of that um, economies of scale that we can only fly a Mavic 500 meters in each direction, um, mm -hmm. you know, along a linear asset. So we're only getting a kilometer of those 78,000 Ks that we need to get um, before we have to pack up and move on. Mm -hmm. um, and to fly extended line of sight or, or um, beyond line of sight has proven to be extremely challenging for us over the last sort of, 18 months as we've, mm -hmm. um, you know, progressed our capability um, and evidenced our, both our capability and the risk to to CASA. So mm -hmm. we've got some good wins with those um, tool of trade type um, use cases. We've got some good wins with some of the um, obscure use cases like the nighttime thermos, um, which is really, really valuable for us. Mm -hmm. um, but to be able to then scale to either a visual spectrum or um, thermal or LIDAR as a payload, we really need to break that range um, barrier uh, mm -hmm. so that the economies of scale can stand up even though a helicopter is frightfully expensive, it can mm. fly a long way and it can fly it very quickly. So um, we've got a bit of a barrier there that we need to get past next. And, you know, wet finger in the air, maybe 18 months' time, we might be in a situation where we've got um, more enablement through some, um, you know, uh, better considered regulations so that I can go and um, do those ranges and prove that it's safe enough. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was going to say that's another perfectly because that was going to be the next one <laughs> around. Um, yeah, it is. And I think it's, uh, I definitely think drones add a lot of value to it. But yeah, I think that's another common question around. Um, there are still our cases where manned aviation that, yes, more expensive and you're sort of at the behest of of, 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 of doing it that way. But um, yeah, someone's saying, you know, you can cover kilometres of um power line in, in a single day as opposed to moving back and forth but that was going to be a thought your thoughts around that and i guess as far as uh, appropriate to ask what what are your plans on those areas of ev loss of can we extend that more than a kilometer of um assessment at a time particularly the lidar stuff and um yeah what what are you currently doing in that space now the uh the ev loss we've got uh currently in our uh Reox, so we've had that for a little while now and um we are doing extended line of sight uh, in two different categories. Uh, one being where we've got uh, that uh, tool of trade operation happening. We've trained up our observers that it's enabled us to go out to um, a K and a half in each direction. Mm. Um, so if I position that crew at a tee off on our network, uh, particularly in events like we've had down here recently with um, storm response where we have to patrol um, power lines to make sure there's been no damage after um, an outage or find the damage if we know that there is. Mm. Um, 
you know, I can extend four and a half Ks uh, of, of inspection from that one location. You know, the technology is more than capable of doing it. Um, the telemetry is more than suitable. The location data, um, all those fail safes, I don't think is any surprise to most people on this call. We know that the technology is more than capable of being able to do that. Mm. I appreciate Cass's concern is around ground and air risk. Um, but yeah, we are able to um, do that now within our current um, REOC and it has proven to be really, really beneficial. Um, in respect to training, uh, yeah, we've done in-house training through our REOC um, as approved by CASA. Um, we are using uh, both telemetry and um, stabilized binoculars, uh, which is assisting. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe that that's uh, reaching our, um, our requirements uh, for risk management. And uh, yeah, that K and a half limit is pretty good. Where we're flying as well, we are flying in in generally pretty flat spaces. So you know, with a good pair of eyes, you're on the edge of visual line of sight. To be honest, anyway, even with something as small as a Mavic, and if we put up something like a Matrice or our um, Free Space Callisto, you can see that still even at a K and a half, which is um, is still pretty good. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. That's that's uh, that's great. Um, well, just cautious of time. I think there's uh, got a heap of other questions, but I'll maybe ask them later. Uh, probably the last couple um, Q and A, uh, and selfishly, I saw you send that this this image through the other day. Um, curious to to see how you guys are using Fly Freely. I guess how's that help your operations from your perspective of of um, how how you currently use it with your ops and um, and what's it sort of enabled you to do? Yeah, so we had a, a safety management system prior to. Um to fly freely, which was helping with our uh, operations. Uh, we use fly freely for all of our flights. Um, currently in talks about some uh, automation and some um, augmentation around our risk management. But again, similar to making sure that all of our pilots were, um, were repo holders, uh, we felt that it was important to manage everything associated with our risk um, really, really tightly. It's somewhat selfishly for me because I do want to keep pushing hard against um, current regulation regarding things like EVOS and BVOS. But to do that, we have to do that from a position of a clean slate and to be seen to be as well as genuinely managing our risk as well as we possibly can. So um, having something like Fly Freely has been um, really helpful in maintaining that. Uh, the data um, chain that we maintain as part of that is really great too. Recent enhancements would be able to do things like bring in the um, flight logs has been very helpful in sort of pulling everything into a single um, pane of glass rather than having multiple apps that we have to deal with has been uh, super handy. But yeah, uh, it, it's been it's been very helpful. We've always had um, you know something along these lines in terms of you know uh, aviation um, flight management. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, fly freely has been. Uh, very helpful with uh, managing in that today. Yeah, you can see from the screenshot there, we've been, um, I think this is from about six months, might've been this year, or might've been last year, but yeah, it's it's a fairly small snapshot of the number of flights and where we're flying um, mm. have been, but you can see that we are flying quite a bit. Awesome, awesome, mate. No, thanks for uh, shining light on. I can I can say bacon for today's session. Uh, cool, mate. And probably the last one uh, for some other Q&A stuff, because I think we're a little bit over time, but um your your folks the next 12 months um i was reading a bit of stuff online you guys are up to some really cool things um and i guess we're appropriate to shed some light i'd love to hear what, what you guys are planning for 2024 yeah so our, our big one at the moment is uh, beyond visual line of sight um we have been um testing our beyond visual line of sight system um over the last few weeks and have flown out to uh, six Ks uh, from um, takeoff location, which is pretty cool and maintained um, really, really good, uh, both um, command and control connectivity and even visual feed, um, which is really promising. So again, hardware is there, it is capable, it is doing the ranges um, that we want. Um, we just got to get the regulator there. So, uh, mm. you know, it took us a long time to just get that training location approved. Um, but we're getting there, uh, baby steps. So next year, um, really hoping that we will have got our first uh, in anger um, beyond visual line of sight um, mission completed. Um, that is with our own REOC, with our own people, um, mm. own pilot. Uh, that's really, really exciting for me. And, and all the learnings that have come along the way with that, um, we can feed back into our other operations. Um, so that may mean... Um, 
beyond visual line of sight for other airframes and other um, other use cases. So next year, uh, in a very very short uh, answer, is we just want to fly further, um, mm -hmm. and and we're well on our way to that, which is really exciting. Uh, the other element that we've got uh, currently in um, a construction site over in New South Wales is our Category Two. Correct me if I'm wrong. Category Two Evlos, where we're flying. Mm -hmm. um, a drone in a box, which you've got pictured there from DJI. Mm -hmm. uh, that's doing daily uh, construction site um, inspections for us, uh, doing delta analysis and the like. And that's being flown from Adelaide, um, which is mm -hmm. really exciting with a, a local observer. So mm -hmm. being able to do full teleoperation of a relatively light airframe like that mm -hmm. on effectively a commercial um, property rather than um, where a lot of them have been getting some good traction in the likes of oil and gas and, and resource sector. Uh, mm -hmm. Really exciting to have that um, operational now and, and looking forward to finding other use cases where we can deploy that same capability. Uh, being able to fly that out automatically daily has been mm. massive for that construction site and for their um their takeoffs and everything. So that's a really interesting use case that we're keen to explore and expand on. We want to also push that one to be on visual line of sight entirely um, mm -hmm. with that teleoperation from Adelaide um, to New South Wales. So um, yeah, just a lot of learning, a lot of um, pushing to get our approvals and then, uh, yeah, seeing what we can do to expand those approvals around more and more of our network. Um, having some some good conversations within our industry as well has been um, very positive. You know, I'm, I'm one of many within um, the power line space that are highly engaged in this and highly energized to, to make things happen. Um, so yeah, really eager to continue uh, pushing as an industry really to, to mm. improve mm. access to, to the airspace to inspect our network. Absolutely. And I think that's, as you said too, it's like, you know, it's something we encounter a lot. It's, you know, the technology's there and it, it's it's possible, but yeah, do it appropriately and safe. Um, there's uh, the autonomous BV loss in the docks there. We hear some, um, theoretically, it makes so much sense. Everyone go, oh, let's go straight to automation. It just makes, you know, it's so much easier, much more safe. But the reality, and then we're sort of noticing people are, as you said, pushing that envelope and trying to find those use cases and testing and trialing and see that we're seeing where they can do it. But yeah, if we can take more people out of the way and make things a bit faster and a bit cheaper. Um, be super keen to hear what happens next on that. Um, and everyone's pretty pretty, pretty, uh, pretty good to share what they're working on as well, which is always uh, super helpful. So keen to see what happens there next. Um, cool, mate. Might just jump over for some questions. Um, I'll open it back up to everyone sort of jumping on the call there. If you have any questions, there's a little chat uh, on the bottom right corner, I believe, or in the middle. Um, shoot it through and we can sort of walk through and, Ask Nick a couple of questions, but um, yeah. And to, as um, people are maybe having a think, um, thanks again, mate. This is really helpful. There's some really cool stuff. I learned a couple of things. I took a few notes myself, but um, keen to see what happens next year. I know you guys always got stuff planned, and, and as you said, marching is always on the front foot. So keen to see what happens then. Yeah, definitely. Um, a question regarding the the Callisto. Uh, the Callisto we were flying with no payload for our testing. We will be flying it with a um, an IXM100 uh, camera from Phase One. That's the 100 megapixel camera. Um, that that airframe is sort of dual purpose for us. Obviously, it's got the the high MTO capacity, so we're using it for um, stringing power lines as well, which is our sort of third um, use case for drones. Uh, but the flexibility of the the platform. Um, has meant that we can also carry a camera on it. Uh, so yeah, we're still eyeing out the bugs with that one, but working really closely with uh, with free space on that. And um, yeah, uh, being able to fly that, I think like I mentioned, uh, yeah, out to six Ks, which has been really good. And and like I say, full radio comms is is really exciting. Hundred percent from that one point five to six meters definitely makes a difference. Um, Cool, mate. I was going to say, you can see those questions there. But I the, can, yeah. <laughs> the next I can, one. I'll just pick through them if you want. Yeah, if you want. I, I might even read them out just in case people can't see them on their side. Sure. But um, uh, do you outsource any of the pilots uh, or are they all in-house? Yeah, we we have majority in-house. I have um, I have some operations where we've woven in drone operations as to other into other tasks. Um just because it made sense to do so, but the vast majority of our uh, our drone operations is done within Enervan and Sappen. Uh, it was a decision we, we made pretty early on that um, we wanted to be able to walk the walk 
it's not necessarily a long-term objective to do full um, operations as we expand how far we can fly and how frequently can, we can fly. Um, we're not necessarily wedded to the idea of doing everything in-house forever. Mm -hmm. um, but I think similarly in where we used to uh, crew helicopters ourselves uh, when we were doing some of the stuff uh, that we now contract out the helicopters, um, having an inherent understanding and a deep understanding of exactly what we can and can't do with drones today or into the future just means it's a lot easier to manage a contract into the future um, as that capability gets um, you know, uh, more evenly dispersed. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, mate. Uh, the other one was from anonymous attendee. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned all your pilots are linesmen. Um, do you have any asset inspectors that are not linesmen and do they use drones? Yeah, so that's that outsourced one that we do um, have, that edge use case where we have asset inspectors that fly drones. Um, some of our asset inspectors are linesmen as well, um, but yeah, they, uh, they will use drones in some situations for particular failure modes. Um, we have a, a pretty high uh, marginal cost when it comes to attending locations, as I mentioned earlier, just given the ge geographical nature of our network. So uh, yeah, we do have some that um, are using them um, and yeah, trying to increase that as well. Awesome, awesome. Um, next one was, oops, coming through now, pretty thick and fast. Uh, are you capturing conductor health slash uh, defect data along the spans or currently focusing on um, pole top slash structure imagery? That's a really good question. Um, yeah, that that's the that's the elephant in the room, uh, frankly, for a, a lot of these conversations around power line um, inspection. Um, all well and good to have a photo of a pole top, but if you have conductor that um, is going to fail mid span and you don't have a way of inspecting that, then really, what's the point? Because you still have to send someone out to look at the rest of the asset. So, it's something we've been you know very aware of. I've done some. Um, internal uh, work with um, segmentation and computer vision AI to uh, detect broken strands and corrosion um, on conductor. And a colleague of mine, Mark Hocking, has done some amazing work um, in training models and uh, developing that capability to extract, extract the conductor out of the image um, and analyze that for, uh, for defects. Um, mm. So we have been conscious of it. The easy part, arguably is just flying to a single pole top taking a couple of photos of it and moving on mm. but for it to be again scalable and um, potentially mean that we can um, weave it more into our BAU type uh, inspections we need to be really good at getting that conductor defect data it's also while we're running the IXM100 uh, camera payload because it is a 100 megapixel camera it mm. means that at a reasonable range we can still collect we're aiming for about 15 to 30 pixels across um, a good size conductor, um, but we also run some conductor, which is three strands and barely 10 mil across. So um, it's a real challenge, but it's something we're, we're very aware of and want to solve um, as well as just taking photos of the pole top. Awesome, mate. Awesome. Good answer. Uh, the next one we had here was, um, have you given any thought to fixed wing for longer distance uh, transmission line surveys? Yeah, yeah, it's a really good uh, application and and I probably haven't mentioned, but we are um, operating exclusively multi-rotors uh, within the business. Um, it's been um, really just because of the stop and hover requirement of our current um, inspection and data collection, it's, it makes it easier for us to be able to stop and hover. Mm -hmm. When we want to do things like surveying, we have done some trials with the likes of um, Carbonics, which have been really promising. Um, fixed wing definitely has a use case and a use case I'm very interested in engaged mm -hmm. uh, with industry to, to have a look at. Um, what we do though with the fixed wing is hit that limitation of um, extended line of sight, at least at the moment, um, very, very quickly. So um, we're we're working with lots of industry partners in solving that, and we do have an interest in fixed wing. Um, obviously, the the flight time is massive. The stability is pretty cool, and um, yeah, being able to put a decent payload on like a lidar unit to get um, fast and, and efficient lidar mm. is a really tasty use case. It just hits that beaver loss problem um, mm. a little bit faster at the moment. So mm. we're looking at it. We're working with those partners and. Um, I guess once the regulate uh, the regulators um, come to the party, we'll say, and uh, and give us the capacity to fly that bit further with some of those airframes, then yeah, we'll definitely be looking at those as another um, use case. 
Awesome, mate. Awesome. Good answer. Uh, yeah, the BV loss seems to be that main sticking point, right, for, for sort of most things. Um, awesome. The next one, uh, how do you manage your data slash imagery? Do you use supervised machine learning tools? Uh, at the moment, we've... <laughs> yeah, it's a really good question. Yeah. I might start a little bit. I'll, I'll, I'll zoom out and say that AI at the moment, particularly machine learning and computer vision, is just moving so fast. It's incredible. Um you know, we'll start a project and, uh, you know, within three months, there'll be a new model that's been released or a new mechanism or a new method. Um, mm. And, you know, you sort of throw three months of uh, research and, and R&D down the, the drain and you start again mm. because um, you don't need it. Uh, we've got some really good training sets that we're maintaining. Um, we've recently kicked off a project using uh, segmentation, some of the auto segmentation um, software that's available out there. Uh, mm. to both do training but also to identify um, uh, equipment within the photos. We're still uh, very immature in defect detection within uh, the imagery. Uh, there's a few different ways you can slice and dice it. I mentioned the conduct defect stuff, which is one, but uh, some of the visual defects that we're talking about are really difficult to um, either see with computer vision or classify well with computer vision. So... That's something that we're very conscious not to put the cart before the horse with and not create this amazing you know, AI pipeline um, mm. that we can't fill efficiently. But at mm. the same time, we don't want to be in a situation where you know, we get that um, coveted email from CASA saying approved mm. and we go and start collecting 10,000 images a day and, and have this backlog that we can't review. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, at the moment, it's a little bit ad hoc. Uh, we're mm. also working with other um, platform providers to to look at how some of those commercial off-the-shelf type solutions can help. Mm. But I do still come back to that that problem that because the technology is moving so fast, um, whether or not we build it ourselves or, or work with someone to do it, mm. having that agility to be able to go, right, this is new, it's better, let's use it, mm. um, is really nice to have at the moment. I don't know if it'll ever slow down, but uh, perhaps once we start getting that people or stuff, we'll have to um, sort of, yeah, pick something and run with it. Yeah, yeah, a heap of data coming in. It's a, yeah, I agree. There's no point automating something before it's, um, you can do it properly, like sort of manually as well. Yeah. Um, cool, mate. Uh, there's a heap of questions. We might run out of today, but if it's all right, maybe we just answer a few of them afterwards and, and send them out to everyone if that's okay with cool. you, Nick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, We'll keep going a little bit more time. Um, so uh, how much further are you looking to grow your drone operations? Do you have a number of drones in mind? Um, not necessarily airframes. I mentioned that we have quite a few pilots that aren't flying frequently. Uh, flying more often would be really good for some of that tool of trade application. And some of the barriers associated with that are not necessarily regulatory driven, but um, our own safety system driven. So mm. where we can either automate workflows, um, make workflows uh, a lot easier to do on things like their phone rather than on a laptop. Mm. There's there's a bunch of things that we're trying to do to get um, more uh, flying hours from the airframes we have. Um, number of drones, I don't really have a target in mind. Um, but yeah, what I'd love to be able to do is, is fly more often with what we've got and fly further with what we can. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Um, should choose the last couple here. Uh, uh, hey, Nick, do you use processing programs for your data strings, Bentley, do, uh, drone deploy, et cetera? Uh, short answer is yes. Uh, we use both of those and others. Um, the, the workflow the, for the inspection data, so those inspection imagery rather than, say, photogrammetry um, or, or simple mapping missions, um, we're in a couple of uh, trials or pilots to see what, um, what suits. Uh, for those use cases, the workflow is almost as important, if not more important, than um, the data handling itself because we need to be really, really efficient with our people and make that tool as easy to use as possible. So uh, we are using a lot of those platforms. Um, we are looking at others and, yeah, we'll continue to sort of have a suite that's, uh, I guess, horses for courses. Awesome, awesome. Probably got time for one more. Of course, we've already gone over. We don't want to hold you up anymore. Um, there was an interesting one, and I've heard this before, around um, uh, VTOL. Um, so if you looked into VTOL for aircraft for BV loss, um, with a live feed. Understandably, I think some of the answer is the conditions and their approvals. But um, yeah, what's your thoughts on the VTOL side of things? Uh, yeah, we've we've um, been working with uh, 
like I say, with some industry partners that have got um, VTOL uh, aircraft, um, the airframes, uh, like I mentioned, is probably uh, secondary for me and primary is what data can it get me and how quickly can it get it for me and can it do it safely. Mm-hmm. Um, part of that consideration is the stop and hover capability for the inspection imagery. But if it's something that we can do where we can do mapping or um, LIDAR capture, uh, then, yeah, we're, we're very happy to look at any airframe, frankly, that can achieve it. Awesome. Awesome, mate. Um, yeah, I might, I might just wrap, wrap that up there. There's even more questions coming in. So thank you, everyone, for <laughs> questions. But I'll try with you, Nick. I might catch up after and maybe we just um, jot down a few answers and send it back to the guys if that's if that's possible. Um, and then, uh, but yeah, we might might finish there. But thank you so much, mate. I appreciate the time. I know you're very busy with the storm cleanup and, and everything else. But I know like, the amount of attendees and, and interaction, everyone found it quite helpful. So really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, if anyone, uh, feel free to contact Nick. I know he's on LinkedIn is there as well. Um, but yeah, we enjoy starting these conversations because I know it would be really helpful to share what other people are doing in this industry. So um, thanks again, mate. And uh, yeah, Merry Christmas to you guys and everyone else listening. Hope you guys have a great break and catch you up again in the new year. Thanks for having me. Cheers. No worries. Thanks, mate. See ya.